Let's talk about how we can address human trafficking through the use of technology. And to discuss this, I'm so glad to have with us Dr. Molly Gordon. Uh, She's been actively involved in this area. So Dr. Gordon, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, so in terms of anti-human trafficking efforts, uh, maybe you can uh, start just by telling me a little bit about, um, and, and you're a psychiatrist, uh, let me let everyone know that, um, and, and you teach and you practice clinical work and provide resources. Um, if you can just share uh, what got you involved, particularly in this area and in, in this um, you know field and, and helping with uh, anti-trafficking efforts. Sure. Um, So that's right. I'm a psychiatrist by training um, and I work at Baylor College of Medicine, where I am an associate professor in the Menninger Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And as part of my clinical work, um, I'm involved in teaching student learners across disciplines um, out of Benta, which is a large county hospital. Um, And I work on the inpatient mental health unit there. Um, Many of our patients struggle with acute exacerbations of of chronic mental illness. And it was actually a patient's um, disclosure um, after evaluating the patient numerous times over many years, uh, we realized we had missed that she had been a victim of trafficking. Um, and that was on us. And so we looked we looked to wait for ways in which we could improve that and improve the quality of the care we offered our patients. Um, and when we went to the literature, um, in, in the health literature, we found that there were some folks who were working in anti-trafficking efforts from a public health lens. We reached out to them and we got together with other colleagues and decided that we would try to develop a pilot program to, um, to address the clinical needs of trafficked persons in health healthcare systems. Yeah, so the first piece is like identifying uh, people um, that need services uh, related to trafficking. And uh, is, is it common that people that have been victims of trafficking just won't say anything? They won't bring it up when receiving healthcare services? Right. Um, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, not uncommonly, patients come to health systems during the time they're being trafficked. We know from the work of um, Letter and Wetzel's Journal of Health Policy from 2014 that about 88% of trafficked persons will see a healthcare provider during the time they're being trafficked. But they don't always tell you that they are being trafficked and that's why they need to see a doctor. They're usually coming in for sort of one of one of three reasons related to their trafficking. Either they or there was a delay in their medical or mental health care because they um, were being trafficked. There was uh, mental health harm or physical harm um, that occurred during their trafficking, either by exposure, um, by their trafficker or by a buyer. And then there, there could be mental health and physical sequelae from trafficking shortly after, um, separating from their trafficker requiring health interventions. And so what's the best way for, you know, hospitals and urgent care clinics, et cetera, to, to find out, to identify, uh, patients that, that may be victims of trafficking? Yeah, well, the first is to learn about the topic. Um, trafficking um, can sometimes be confounded with things like uh, labor abuse or sex work or smuggling, and those are very different things than human trafficking. And so um, educating healthcare providers on what trafficking is and what it looks like when it presents uh, to a health provider is really a first step. In some states, like the state of Texas, um, there are bills that require healthcare professionals to complete trainings in human trafficking. Um, other states, we hope, will adopt those sorts of policies to improve education and health systems around trafficking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. That that makes sense. Yeah. You, you have to know. You have to know what you're looking for. Um, and then, if I guess, uh, based upon you know those that criteria or or things that might look like possibly someone's been trafficked, then that would elicit the question or particular questions to find out specifically if they've been trafficked. Is that, is that right? Right. And so if a practitioner um, suspects that a person has been trafficked, there are validated screening tools that can be used and implemented in health systems to screen mm-hmm. for human trafficking. Um, many of those are um, 
out of emergency rooms where the majority of human trafficking uh, patients present. Um, there are also screening tools that can be used in other subspecialty populations, for example, homeless youth or homeless kids. Mm -hmm. um, and so in addition to the screening procedures, um, having a response plan is also very important. Um, most hospitals have response plans put into place for things like child abuse or elder abuse and human trafficking falls under those categories. Um, it is the exploitation of vulnerable populations, including um, adults who uh, may be impaired or um, children, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in, at the hospital that you're working at, in terms of like your anti-trafficking uh, program, um, there's several things that you do, right? You provide education, training, you, uh, you do like have screening, you have the response plan, can you kind of give us like an overview of, of what you've done and what is the impact of that, Ben? What does that impact look like at the hospital? Uh, like, were you all surprised by the numbers and, and really, and, you know, is, how effective has it been? Uh, well, well, the answer is uh, we do a lot of different things. Um, mm -hmm. The first is we do a lot mm -hmm. of education and training of healthcare providers. Um, that is a very hard thing to do when you are a clinical provider, um, to leave your clinic or your unit to um, give lectures in the middle of the day um, or in the evenings. Um, and so uh, virtual technology options to be able to do that has been wonderful, especially for audience members who may not have to sit um, through a, a lecture in real time after work. They can listen to the, the talk um, on, their, on their drive home. So it's become a very efficient way of training large amounts of healthcare providers. So we've trained thousands and thousands of providers across discipline, surgeons, ER doctors, um, uh, across health systems, public and private hospitals, across uh, practitioners, uh, trainees, advanced practitioners, nurses, social workers, doctors, et cetera. Um, so that's been very meaningful. And we know that that training is important because then um, then we get called. So we know that. Yeah, that, that is definitely a, uh, a sign that, you know, people are listening. Right. That so, yeah. so, so that training is meaningful because patients um, get identified in response to that, those educational outreach measures. We know that mm -hmm. it changes behavior of the practitioner because um, they mm -hmm. pick up the phone and calls when they may have not previously. So since, uh, you know, if we look at just our hospital's data, um, since, you um, Developing the pilot program in 2017, we've screened over 650 patients, a little bit over 70% of whom were positively identified as victims oh, wow. of labor or sex trafficking. And so that doesn't include um, data from other healthcare partners that, that are part of our um, consortium. Um, and yeah, so and I just want to note that's that's a large percentage that were uh, identified from the screening. You said right. over 70%, over 70% of those that were provided the screening tested like positive basically for trafficking. Yeah. Right. It's not, it's not perfect, you know, in, in our validated tools, they're about 90%. And that's what we would like in a, in screening for patients with mental health comorbidities or in, in patients that we're suspecting mm -hmm. maybe victims of labor trafficking, either adults or kids. So there's definitely areas for improvement in screening and, and it's great. It's good, but not great. Mm -hmm. um, and so we hope to improve upon that. So we have mm -hmm. been able to identify a lot of patients and, and when we identify them, they get evaluations for their biopsychosocial needs, their medical needs, their surgical needs, mm -hmm. their mental health needs, their psychological mm -hmm. needs, their social needs, their housing needs, mm -hmm. needs for rehab or uh, law enforcement or legal recourse. So they get um, wraparound services and case management as part of that identification process. And, mm -hmm. and we do believe that that, that um, helps improve not only their access to care, but access to social services and support. Um, mm -hmm. we, we have written a lot of papers in this space, um, mm -hmm. you know, describing our work, including the value of telehealth in this space. Mm -hmm. um, during COVID, we knew that there was an increase in violence and that, um, that patients were being told not to come to the hospital unless they had signs and symptoms of an infectious illness at the very beginning of the, of the pandemic. Right. And so that makes it difficult when you're working with victims of violence who may not present with an infectious cause who need health um, healthcare for other reasons. And so telehealth was able to step in and fill that gap. Um, so mm -hmm. we do a lot of clinical care, um, a lot of research, and then a lot of um, a lot of advocacy work about encouraging hospital systems 
to implement a policy and then a solution to educate and identify trafficked persons in their health systems. And if, mm -hmm. and if using health telehealth is, is the most efficient way to do it, then we would encourage hospitals to consider that. Yeah. So it sounds like before this initiative, a lot of people were being missed in terms of this really important need um, because you, you've identified and helped a lot of people. Uh, and with telehealth, um, besides the pandemic, besides the restrictions on, you know, going to a hospital, uh, have you seen utilizing telehealth, just being able to connect with people and provide resources electronically, that that's been important? Um, you know, if so, how? how? How important has that been? And what's what's been most helpful in that regard? Yeah, I'll give um, sort of two examples of that. Um, the first would be in case management. You know, I trained in the day where everything was done in paper, but to to allow um, allow patients who are receiving case management through our program to um, to call or FaceTime their case manager in real time when they're um, struggling um, with with a particular health or social need um, has been incredible to watch. So we have a cell phone that's on during work hours. And so it allows patients to connect to our team directly um, all day long. Um, and so um, that, that prevents calling and leaving messages or sending emails and waiting for responses. So those, that really does improve the real time effect. Yeah. So I just want to kind of note that, that the real time uh, is really important with this kind of work and, and with other kinds of behavioral health uh, or substance use um, struggles uh, where people need help now, like when they're reaching out, that's when they need to connect. And, and when, if you wait, you could, you can lose that opportunity. Uh, right. And, and some, sometimes those, those needs are health related and sometimes they're social related. Mm. Sometimes it's mm -hmm. related to food insecurity or transportation or um, occupational needs. And sometimes it's related mm -hmm. to a mental health crisis or mm -hmm. access to medication. So all sorts of things mm -hmm. require case management contact that, that need urgent or semi-urgent responses. Yeah. And the human connection in real time, I point that out because I, I get frustrated sometimes with telehealth service providers where you know, you'll, if, if you're seeking telehealth services, you go to a platform, you'll schedule the appointment on your own, but there's no human being that you can speak to that's knowledgeable about the services, knowledgeable about the billing, knowledgeable about the operations that you can speak to, to ask questions. And that causes a lot of problems in the telehealth world, uh, just in healthcare in general. Um, so it's like using technology for that connection and to provide services, but also having a person, a staff, uh, that they can connect with. It's kind of that, uh, handholding, um, and handholding is needed for anyone, no matter how, even if they're a physician themselves in the medical field, like they still need handholding when receiving services, uh, often. So, yeah. So I, I just want to point that out. I think that's a fantastic uh, thing that you all do, um, rather than completely trying to automate something. Right, right. And, and then frustrating somebody who may already feel frustrated for one reason or another. Yeah. Um, it takes that out of the equation. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then telehealth has, has been able to, to, to move quickly. I mean, so I think the pandemic um, accelerated the rate at which services became available. Um, mm -hmm. Everything from inpatient services, um, team meetings that could happen uh, with a patient that include all of their, um, their staff members um, in real time that could get together when there was, where there was um, a requirement for physical distancing. Those are some of those things we've continued um, after, after some of the pandemic restrictions have lifted because patients mm -hmm. really liked them. Um, mm -hmm. They liked, for example, having an interdisciplinary meeting with our team and being able to access everyone on our team in real time, but maybe not having 20 people in the room. So yeah. it feels like they are connecting more to their providers without feeling um, like all eyes are on them. And so those are the things that patients have told us that we don't consider sometimes um, how daunting it may feel to have an interdisciplinary team of providers at the table with someone and how that may feel very intimidating, less intimidating if it's just 
half or a third of those persons, but everybody else still gets to participate without the intimidation factor or the feeling of, mm -hmm. of um, yes, too many people, especially when you're talking about private matters. Right. Especially private matters. That That's a fantastic point. Yeah. So um, other hospitals uh, or healthcare facilities wanting to implement such a program because uh, it's obviously a really important need is particularly in, in uh, certain areas of the country. Um, how should they get started? Uh, can they contact you or like uh, an organization that's already doing this to, to kind of get assistance with the workflow of implementing such a program? Yeah. So the answer is, of course, they can always contact us. Um, mm -hmm. uh, my email is is public and, and we encourage anyone who has questions about this topic or the space to reach out to us directly. Mm -hmm. um, there are also um, sort of manuals to do how to do this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, heal trafficking, which is um, H-E-A-L, is a public health um, is a nonprofit public health response to human trafficking. Um, and that's led by Hani Stocklosa um, out of Mass General up at Harvard, and they have just recently published an updated toolkit, um, essentially a step-by-step a, a -step guide to building a public health response to human trafficking in your health system. Mm -hmm. and that's who we reached out to um, when, when we were trying to come up with a solution. Um, mm -hmm. Ours is very nuanced to mental health. Um, it is um, it includes hybrid uh, tricks. So it does include like hybrid technology that maybe wasn't mentioned in her toolkit. Maybe her new, um, her new um, guidelines have those recommendations to have mm -hmm. that flexibility. Um, mm -hmm. The American Medical Women's Association has um, a PATH group um, that is a group of interdisciplinary providers across the country who are working in anti-trafficking efforts. Um, so mm -hmm. there's definitely a lot of, a lot more folks now. I think that it's probably increased fourfold just in the last um, maybe five years and the number of persons um, who are involved in, in the anti-trafficking space from a public health approach. Yeah, so it sounds like, would you say any healthcare facility, like any any large hospital ought to have an anti-trafficking program or or is it just certain areas of the country that, that really need to have such a program? Yeah, so that's a great question. I, the answer is everyone. Trafficking is unfortunately everywhere. Um, there are healthcare deserts. Um, and so, um, you know, the first in, in those situations, we need healthcare first and then training second. But, um, but I would, I would mention that any private practice, urgent cares, hospital systems, clinics, um, anywhere you are seeing patients, you are seeing a patient who could be a potential victim of abuse and neglect, including human trafficking. Mm. Wow. That's a, that's a powerful statement. Yeah. Excellent. So, Dr. Gordon, thank you so much. This has been really helpful. And the resources that you mentioned we'll put in the description. Uh, so all of you watching this, uh, please click on those resources. If you have any questions, you could also reach out to Dr. Gordon. And we definitely encourage you to start an anti-trafficking program in your facility. And if you're an independent clinician, it's really important to get trained to, to look at what are those warning signs and then how do you respond? Uh, it's a really important issue. So thanks a lot, Dr. Gordon. Thank you for having me.